Cool. So thank you for joining. So yes, today we're going to be talking about some of the best of Python. We're going to be reviewing some of the language's slickest features. And a little bit about myself. So I'm a software engineer on the Python agent team at New Relic. Uh, I've also worked at software companies in the healthcare and marketing industries as well as hardware at Oracle. Um, I've done research related to the newcomer barriers um, that people face when they join open source software projects. And this is my third time attending PyCon. Uh, my first two were PyCon US, and I got to speak at PyCon US this past year. So today we're going to be talking a lot about syntactic sugar. So I like to think of syntactic sugar as the quirks of a programming language that allow us to write concise and readable code. Now, most programming languages have some version of syntactic sugar, and fortunately for us, Python has a lot. It's important to understand syntactic sugar not only because it helps us to write more extensible and flexible code, but it also helps us to read code better. Because of how prevalent syntactic sugar is in Python, it's important to be able to recognize it and understand what it's doing under the hood. So today we're going to be talking about four concepts in Python, decorators, context managers, list comprehensions, and magic methods. So if you're a newcomer to the language, we'll be walking through some simple examples here. OK, so we're going to start by talking about decorators. So what exactly is a decorator? So a decorator is a function that allows us to change the behavior of another function. The key thing about it is that we can change behavior without changing structure. And the way this works is through implementation of function wrapping, which we'll look at in a minute. Decorators return closures, which is how we're able to modify what a function does without actually changing it. So you might have actually noticed decorators being used throughout the language because Python has multiple built-in decorators already. For example, there's the at class method and at static method decorators, which allow us to turn a function into a class or static method, and depending on whether you want it uh, bound to your class. And then we can also use the at property decorator to turn a, a function into a property accessor. So as we talk about this, it's important to remember that everything in Python is an object, including functions. And because of that, functions have certain properties that allow us to really implement decorators. So for one, we can store them as in variables and in other data structures. That means that if you have a dictionary, for example, you can actually store a function as the value in your key value pair within that dictionary. You can also pass them around to other functions. So they can be used as arguments, and they can also be returned from functions as well. And all these properties are important because we rely on them when we create decorators. So before we can talk about decorators, we need to understand what a closure is. So what we see on the screen here is a simple example of a closure, and it's essentially a nested function. So what this is doing is we have a function convert weight, and nested within it, we have another function, convert to pounds. Now, convert to pounds is doing a simple calculation to convert kgs to pounds, printing out the conversion, and then it's going to return convert to pounds. If you note, convert to pounds is not being called. It's just being returned. In order to actually call it, we have to come and set up our new variable converter, in which we call convert weight with 100 passed to it as the kilograms we want to convert. But what we notice here is this is just going to store convert to pounds in converter. To actually call convert to pounds, we actually need to make a call to converter. And the other thing to note here is the kilograms variable. So kilograms is being passed to convert weight, but it's not actually being passed to convert to pounds, yet we're still using it. So that's an important concept with closures. The inner function is going to have access to the variables defined in the outer scope. So we can still do our calculation even though kilograms was passed on the outer level. So if we run this code, we're going to get our conversion done for us. 100 kilograms is 220 pounds. So this is a closure in, in essence. So now we want to actually uh, bring a decorator in. So what we're going to do first is we're going to modify uh, the way we're getting our kilograms. And we're going to do that by letting our user tell us how many pounds they would like or excuse me, how many kilograms they would like to convert to pounds. So here we're going to take user input, ask them how many uh, kilograms they want to convert, and then we're going to return that user input. So now we have a way to get our kilograms. 
And we're gonna come back to that original closure and modify it. So what we're doing here is instead of passing kilograms in like we were doing previously, we're now gonna pass in an actual function. And that function is gonna be our input function. So again, because of what we talked about before, functions can be passed as arguments. And because of the concept of a closure, the function can be called within convert to pounds, even though it was passed into the outer scope. So now this code will execute as expected, and we can still get the same output. So now let's put it all together. So we have our modified closure now, which takes in a function, and then the function it's gonna take in is get input weight, which is uh, allowing us to let the user tell us how many pound kilograms to convert. And then we do our actual conversion. So this time, we're gonna pass get input weight in as the argument to convert weight. And then we're gonna call converter, which is gonna actually execute convert to pounds. So when we run this, we get the same output, but this time our user told us that they wanted to convert 100 pounds to kilograms. But it's the same concept. So now that we understand this, we can bring the syntactic sugar in. So that's done with the at syntax. So what we have here is our convert weight decorator now being automatically applied to get input weight with the at symbol. And so this goes back to what we talked about previously. We can now call get input weight with no modification to the function, but now all that conversion logic we just wrote is automatically gonna be applied because we're applying it with that at syntax as a decorator. The cool thing about this is that we can actually now use this convert weight decorator to do any type of uh, conversion from kilograms to pounds, and it doesn't have to be used on just this function. Maybe you were looking through a healthcare database and you have patients and their associated weights in kilograms. If you wanted to do a conversion of those kilograms to pounds, you can put the same uh, decorator onto that example, and you wouldn't have to modify the way you're actually getting your data out of the database. So now we have this piece of extensible code that can be used in many different ways. But there's many uses for decorators beyond what we just looked at. So a common example is testing. At New Relic, we use decorators a lot to write validators. So we can encapsulate the assertion logic that we would like to uh, apply to multiple test functions, and we put it into a decorator that we just apply to all of our relevant test functions. If you've used PyTest before, then you've probably seen that they have a suite of decorators, such as PyTest.com. Uh, fixture. So if you want to turn any function into a fixture that can be reused within your test suite, that is done with the decorator as well. Also with error handling, if you have a certain behavior or a uh, log message you like to print based on certain errors, you can encapsulate all of that into a decorator and apply it to any function you'd like error handling done for. Function timing is another case. If you want to start and stop a timer to see how long your function took, you can do that with the decorators. You don't have to manually do your timing in every function you would like to time. And in general, any repetitive option or repetitive operation might benefit from a decorator, given that this is going to allow us to deduplicate our code by encapsulating logic into a function that we can apply across multiple use cases. And there's a ton more uses for decorators, so it's uh, worth seeing if your code could benefit from one. So the next topic we're gonna to talk about is the context manager. So when we talk about context, what we're really referring to is the state surrounding a code section and that can be in the local or the global scope. So we're gonna talk about this in the uh, example of a try finally pattern because this gets us to getting towards a context manager. So we're going to look at it in terms of file IO. So what our try except is doing here is it's basically letting us open a file test.txt in the read mode and we're going to store that into our file pointer f then we're going to print out the uh, lines in that file pointer and then we're going to come into our accept statements. So maybe we want to check if that file was not found uh, and then we want to print out that exception. Maybe we also just want to have a general blanket exception to cover any case, and we want to print that and then return it as well. So the key about this is that no matter what happens in our try accept, whether we hit an exception, whether we hit a return statement, our finally is always going to execute and take care of cleanup for us. So in this case, we're just going to print in our finally that we're actually closing our file, and then we're going to call close on it. So this gets the job done, but it's a bit cumbersome and it's harder to manage 
uh, data in the scope that we care about. So let's convert this to a context manager. And you can see immediately this is much more readable, fewer lines of code. Uh, and we know this is a context manager because we see this with statement. The with statement is helping us set up the context. And for us, open is the context manager that actually is built into Python. So what's actually happening here? Well, on our width line, we're basically entering and creating the context that we're gonna be using for our code execution. We store that context in F with the as statement helping us. Now F is gonna be our file pointer, but it's also our context variable. So now that we have that, we can actually go in and do our uh, code execution and we can use the context variable that we just created. So now we can use that to read the lines out of our file again and print them out. And now, we don't even see anything happening here because it's all encapsulated for us, but once we leave uh, the context of this context manager, we actually have auto cleanup being done for us. So that means our file pointer is being closed without us having to do anything. And this is built into Python's context manager for open. But this makes everything a lot simpler. And we can actually go in and create our own context manager to uh, kind of mirror what we just did, and we can use the context manager protocol to do that. So the context manager protocol is all about uh, defining what you would like to happen when you enter and exit your context. So here, as we said, we're going to remake that uh, context manager for file IO. So in our initialization function, we're gonna take in the name of the file and the mode that we would like to open it in and those are passed to our class constructors. So we can now initialize our class instance with the name and the mode, and then we also are gonna set up a new uh, variable self.file, which is gonna act as our context variable as we uh, go forward with this. So we have our setup done, and now we come into our enter. So enter is letting us define what we would like to happen when we enter our context. So what we would like to do is set up the context by opening that file that we just uh, passed into the, the class constructor. So that's gonna be self.name and self.mode being passed in, and we're just gonna call Python's open function. So now self.file is storing that, and we can return it from enter so it can be used as the um, context uh, variable for our actual code's execution. Then we come into our exit. The cool thing about exit is it's actually gonna handle exceptions for us as well. So we pass our exception type, exception value, and the traceback all to exit, and this will help us to identify if we actually hit an exception when uh, the code executed. So here we're printing that we close the file, and then we print our exception type to identify whether an error actually occurred, and then we call close on our file pointer. Now we can return true or false from exit based on the behavior we would like to see with our exceptions. So in this case, we're returning true because I would like to silence my exceptions. But if I returned false from this, that would propagate your exceptions upward. So you can control the behavior uh, based on what you return from exit. So all of this is gonna allow us to do what the built-in context manager just did, but now we can add our own customizations to it by uh, re-implementing enter and exit. So there are many times you would wanna consider using a context manager, but there are certain patterns you can look out for to kinda of help you make that decision. So if you're ever opening and closing something, like we just saw with the file, maybe you're also opening or closing a database connection, it'd be worth considering using a context manager to encapsulate uh, the opening on enter and the closing on exit. Maybe you're starting or stopping a timer. Again, you could start the timer on enter and stop it on exit. You could acquire a lock on enter or release it on exit. And just any general pattern where you're entering something and exiting something lends itself very well to a context manager's use because that's exactly how the context manager protocol is defined. It's with an enter and, ex and an exit. So now we're gonna talk about list comprehensions. So as a reminder, a list is a data type in Python. It's mutable, it's ordered, and it's iterable. So it's mutable in that we can change it, we can add to it, remove from it, append, delete, any of those. We can also say it's ordered because we can access the elements in it via an index. And it's iterable, which means we can iterate through it, which is what we're going to do in our first example here. So this is a very simple example where we're just gonna go in 
and define a list of Japanese cities. And what we want to do is make a new list that uppercases all of the letters in all of these cities. So to do that, we've initialized a new list to uppercase Japanese cities. And then we're going to come in and loop through our Japanese cities. And we're going to append the uppercase version of the city name to our new list. Now we do that with city.upper. So this is a very simple operation and it gets the job done. So if we print out our new list, we get the exact same thing, but now everything is capitalized. So that did exactly what we wanted it to do, but we can do it again and we can do it with fewer lines of code. And this is where the syntactic sugar comes in with a list comprehension. So now again, we have our same Japanese cities list, but this time we're gonna use a list comprehension to actually uh, set up that new uppercase city. So here we're gonna actually be able to initialize and iterate all in the same line. So we see our brackets on the uppercase Japanese cities, which is telling us that this is gonna be a new list. City.upper is our, um, the, is how we're going to modify the uh, elements that we're putting into our new list. And then we actually do the iteration and get our cities go by going through all of the cities in Japanese cities. So now if we print this out, we get the exact same result. So that was definitely slicker, but was it actually faster? So to test this, we're gonna use a simple example where we start a timer and we initialize a new list. And what we're gonna do here is we're going to go through all of the values in uh, the range one to a million, and we're gonna append those values to our new list. So if we end our timer and print out our value, well, we're gonna get 0.225 seconds. Now if we do that again, but this time we use an actual uh, list comprehension to handle the um, initialization and appending all into one convenient line and start and stop our timer, print that out, now we get 0.157 seconds. Now this was a straightforward operation, but the performance impact can be even greater based on how complex your operations are. So in terms of the benefits to a list comprehension, for one, it's gonna improve your code's readability. When we do use a list comprehension, we can focus more on what the values are that are gonna be in our list versus how they're gonna get there. We don't have to put the emphasis on initializing our list and manually iterating. And instead, we can put the focus on what that new modified value is gonna be that's gonna be added to our new list. And it also gives us reduced overhead. And so the potential for faster execution time is definitely there with the list comprehension, besides it being more readable. Now, our final topic we're gonna to talk about is the magic method. So a magic method is basically a method that is internally invoked for us by Python. And it's done for us based on the operations we're using in our own code. The way we can identify it is with a double underscore that's appended and prepended to the function's name. And uh, it's represented also as dunder methods. So let's look at a popular one that most people have probably seen before, and that's dunder init. So we have a class user, and dunder init is basically initializing our new class instance. We have self, name, and age passed to it. Now name and age are gonna be passed directly to our class constructor. But self actually is cool because it's being created by another magic method under the hood called dunder new. Dunder new actually creates the class instance, which is represented by self, and then dunder init actually initializes that class instance. So here we're just gonna set up our instance to store the name and the age that was passed to our class constructor. Um, and now that's available when we create our new class object, Paul user. And it's quite easy to check for magic methods on an object if you're ever curious to know what's available to you. So you can do this by making a call to dir on whatever object you'd like to check for methods on. So this is a method that allows us to see the methods and the uh, properties that are available on your object. So here we tried it on uh, the string hello, and we can see there's a ton of magic methods already available to us. So a lot of them have to do with string comparison or uh, attribute accessing. And the magic of the magic method really is everywhere. There's many cases where there's a magic method being used under the hood and we may not even realize it. So for example, uh, if we try to check len on uh, a certain string, we wanna get the length of that string. 
That under the hood is gonna call dunder len, which in turn is gonna return to us the number of characters in that string. There's also dunder contains, which is uh, invoked for us automatically if we use the in operator. So if I wanna know how many, or if a certain string is present in another string, dunder contains will be called under the hood, and then that's going to return true or false based on whatever was searched for is actually present in your, in your string. Then there's also dunder call. Now dunder call allows us to turn uh, class instances into callables. We can treat them as functions almost because gender calls invoked under the hood when we actually make a call to it. And then another important thing to talk about with magic methods is operator overloading. So let's look at an example of how the same exact method is implemented in three separate ways based on the class it's used in. So dunder adds is going to be invoked when we have our plus sign uh, being called under the hood. So our first example here is two integers. If we add two integers together with the plus sign, we're going to be getting uh, the sum of them, and that's because of the way that dunder adds is implemented on uh, the int class in Python. Now, we can do the same thing again, but adding two strings together, and that's gonna concatenate them, and that's because there's a completely separate implementation of dunder adds on the string class. Now, the same concept goes for lists. We can add two lists together to join them, but again, there's a completely different uh, way that dunder adds is implemented for, for lists. So given that we can make changes, let's actually try to change a magic method ourselves. So here we have that same user class, and I wanna actually try to print out what our user object looks like. So if I call print on Paul user, well, I get something that's not very readable. This is supposed to be string representation of the, of the object, but it doesn't tell me any actual valuable information about that user. So I wanna change this by re-implementing the dunderstir class, now, or dunderstir method. This method's gonna allow us to customize the string representation of our class object. So I would like to actually know the username and the age of the person that I'm uh, representing with this class object. So I'm gonna return a formatted string with that information, and if I print that, now I get their name and their age, and this is much more useful if I'm trying to compare class objects, because I know what's being represented by it. So why should we actually bother to modify magic method? Well, it allows us to op implement operator overloading, which helps us to customize the predefined uh, methods that are already present by extending the functionality they have, which means we can change the predefined behavior of a function. And different classes can define the same method differently, as we saw with Dunder adds. And this is really helpful if we're trying to do object-oriented programming. Now, everything that we've talked about here is connected. You might have noticed that magic methods were actually discussed already in the context manager protocol with Dunder enter and Dunder exit. Dunder enter and Dunder exit are the keys to the context manager protocol, but all that means is that we're just taking the magic methods on a class and we're just customizing them to do what we want for our own use case for our context manager. And then there's also the context lib module, which we didn't talk about today, but it's a module that allows us to create our own context managers um, by applying decorators. So there is a decorator context lib dot context manager that we can apply to our generator functions to turn them into context managers without actually modifying the generator function itself. So a lot of these concepts overlap, and you'll see that more. Just to wrap things up, it's important to be mindful of the design patterns that you choose to implement. Sometimes the same pattern can get the same result, but it's up to you as a developer to decide what makes the most sense for your use case. For example, you could implement function timing with a decorator or a context manager, but based on what your code's doing, one might be more preferred. And then we also have the important idea that syntactic sugar may not always be the answer. Even though it's cool and it's slick, sometimes it's better to be more explicit in your code. And it's more to think about who's using your code and for what purpose. Is it gonna be open sourced? Is it an internal tool at your company? Whatever the reason is, you should think about why it's going to be used and how, and make your calls based on that. And with that, thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, do we have any questions for Uma? Yes. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, maybe uh, just now you mentioned like more explicit, right? Uh, to me, like seems there's uh, many magics. Like we don't know. Uh, actually, the internally you call the init first or the new like exit as well as the finally, right? And then the other things is like how do we know like the print without the stir will print the like uh, function information. Yeah, they kind of information basically. Uh, uh, is there any list or documentation we can refer to? Uh, so for magic methods, uh, a lot of these things are documented in Python's official documentation. Um, when it comes to being explicit, it's harder with uh, magic methods because the point of them is to not be something you have to worry about because it's implemented under the hood for you. So it's when it comes to the magic method specifically, it's something that if you would like to see a change in the behavior that's automatically being invoked, you will need to make a change. But if you're looking at a different concept like a context manager or a list comprehension, it might be better to actually do the traditional approach instead of getting too fancy in your code if, uh, if it's based on the use case. All right, thank you. Uh, at the f yeah, the one at the front. Hello, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, so I'm coming from a more of a C and C++ uh, developer, right? So I was very surprised when I first saw uh, list comprehensions, for instance. I wasn't like, uh, have no idea that that existed in Python. So my question is, how would you recommend to kind of learn this uh, new things in, in Python, like uh, list comprehensions, context managers, uh, and stuff like that? I think when it comes to learning these concepts, what's more important to understand first is the traditional way of doing it. So with the list comprehension, making sure you really understand how to do list iteration in that traditional way with the for loop. And once, if we go immediately into the syntactic sugar, it can just get confusing because you need to understand what it's actually trying to accomplish. So I would say most of the examples we looked at, we kind of saw the, the original or maybe more cumbersome way of doing something, but you should try to learn that approach first before you go to the syntactic sugar approach, is, is what I would say. Okay, thank you. Have we got any more questions? No. Going once, going twice, okay. Oh, yeah, we have one more. Thank you for your talk. Uh, everything is so useful for us, maybe. Uh, do you have anything you cannot add to this presentation, but it's so useful as you know, writing the Python code? Uh, so, so, sorry, what was that? So if, if you have anything to, you cannot add to this, uh, no, you cannot talk about in this presentation, but you think you, it's useful. Um, yeah, actually, when I was writing this, I initially was uh, wanted to talk about descriptors. That's another protocol, and it helps us with attribute access. So that's what I actually wanted to, to do here, but it would have taken half the presentation itself. So descriptors are also important, I think, because attribute access is so important in Python to understand how you're actually getting an attribute off of an object. So that's definitely one I would have, I wanted to talk about today, actually. <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. We've got time for one or two more questions, if there's any. No, okay, Let, can we have a big round of applause for Uma? <laughs>